Well, as I was walking over to the uh, breakfast this morning, a bunch of people said, Hugh, you've been working a lot. Are you ever going to take a vacation? I says, yeah, I just signed up Kathy for another mountaineering trip. He says, she hasn't divorced you yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> But yeah, this is a place where it's really uh, cushy, so, uh, but it's gorgeous scenery. So we're going to be doing that this summer. And yeah, on the 25th, I'll be uh, preaching at uh, our Christ Church of the Valley. Uh, that's the church that's sponsoring our AMP conference, and they have me doing the evening and uh, morning uh, services. I think they have eight services there, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, <coughs> uh, if, you'd, if we run out of these uh, questions we have on the book of Isaiah, I got more here, okay? So I think we should have plenty for everybody. I'll try to remember to keep bringing those in case you ever forget to bring yours. And, uh, you know, people were asking me last week, you know, how come you skipped over the uh, Song of Solomon? Well, you know, people read a lot into that song. I mean, I've read commentaries on that book, and boy, uh, yes, I've even read commentaries where people saw a lot of science faith issues in that text. Uh, because of how metaphorically it's written, you can read almost anything into it you want. Uh, but yeah, there is actually one text in there. Uh, that has significance for science apologetics. It's actually a scientific prediction of the uh, birth and the development of our state of California. And you'll see it right here, Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 11. <laughs> okay? So there's California for you. <laughs> and you can read it on several different levels, and it still applies. Okay. So it's one example of how people can interpret the Song of Solomon to say almost anything they want. Okay. Well, as I mentioned in previous weeks, what we're going to do in this class is uh, try to a little exercise. And the exercise is this, of actually looking at particular issues in the Bible and actually quickly picking up all the biblical texts that deal with that issue. And it requires uh, some discipline in the sense that what I'm going to be asking you to do as we go through these study questions I've given you is to actually get into small groups here. So I'm going to break up into small groups and challenge you to read through the whole book within a few minutes and dig up all the relevant passages of the question I've asked. Okay, now here's a discipline it requires. I tried this on myself a couple of times and Isaiah is so captivating. It's filled with all kinds of different topics and it's so easy to get distracted. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just see if I can actually go through the whole book of Isaiah in 10 minutes and pick up all the passages that have to do with the cosmic beginning and God's involvement in the cosmic beginning. And I find myself being distracted by all the prophecies about the modern nation of Israel. I found I'm being uh, fascinated by all the theological issues that are being raised, issues about the Trinity. I said, I gotta stop. So that's kind of what I'm gonna ask you to do. We're going to give you a, a few minutes to actually try to pick up all these passages, but in order to do it quickly, you have to blank out everything that's not relevant to the question. And I think it's going to be challenging for us as we get started, but the advantage is it's a way to kind of get answers from the scripture text without taking years and years to get the answer. And frankly, that's how I do a lot of my Bible study, is I'll focus on a particular topic and throw everything else and just look for that one thing. And uh, pick up all the passages and you can study the passages in some depth. So that's what we're gonna do. And so I'm actually gonna record them here for you, okay? So as you pick them up in your small groups, we're gonna build a little list here of all the passages relevant to each of these questions we have here in the text. And the first question is this, what Isaiah passages address the beginning of the universe. Now you're going to find a lot of texts in the Bible that deal with the history of the universe. We're going to focus on the texts that deal with the beginning of the universe. What do these passages say about the universe? How can we use these Isaiah texts to persuade people that God exists and the Bible is the Word of God? Now, uh, it'd be quite easy to go through all these uh, chapters in Isaiah 
and pick up the few passages that actually mention the beginning of the universe. However, that won't really give you the theology of the beginning of the universe. You also need to pick up those texts that talk about how God engages in creating the universe. And uh, you know, so I want you to also look at the different theological perspectives, because a lot of what you see in Isaiah is God claiming that he's the one who begins the universe. He creates the universe. But you'll see several texts that talk about him refuting other ideas from other religions about the beginning of the universe. So he basically will say, I don't do this, I do this, and I do this in this way. And, you know, I don't just start the universe, I'm the one who actually planned out how it would all be. So I want you to look for those texts as well. Because as we try to answer this question, we're going to need to know exactly how God engages in beginning the universe, what his purpose is for starting the universe the way he did. So pick up those passages as well, and I'll give you a hint. You're going to wind up with over 12 passages. So if your list has only four passages, keep reading and studying, okay? So uh, I think, let's see, uh, what probably be best why don't you break up into groups of six? Six each, and if it's five, I'm okay with that. If it's seven, I'm okay with that. But approximately six people each, and I'm going to time you. I'm going to give you uh, 12 minutes, okay? Uh, to find, literally go through the book of, now we're talking 66 chapters. It's one of the longest books in the Bible. But it's, it's like my Bible, uh, it's written, I mean, the poetry is lead, led out as opposed to the prose. <coughs> and you can, actually, you can actually quickly skim through the text relatively quickly and pick up all these passages. Okay, they might ask the question, how much time did it take you to do this? I got it done in under 10 minutes. So uh, it was actually about six or seven minutes. It can be done, yes. Okay. Am I a speed reader? Here's how you speed read. I mean, the reason why a lot of people are not speed readers, they try to get everything out of the text that's there and not miss anything. You do that, it's going to take you a couple of hours to get through the book of Isaiah. But if all you do is look for one thing, you can get through it in a few minutes. Now, as I already told you, Isaiah addresses dozens of different topics. So the trick is, don't get distracted by everything else that Isaiah is talking about. There's a lot of material here, for example, on how God's going to redeem rebellious people. Just shut that out of your mind. Now what you can do, later on you can say, I'm going to speed read the book of Isaiah, and I'm going to pick up all the texts that talk about how God redeems rebellious people. I mean, you can do that. And you know, that's what I've been you know, telling my family members. The trick to speed reading the Bible, one topic at a time. So for example, uh, several years ago, I went through the entire Bible only picking up those passages that talk about family, marriage, and divorce. How much time did it take me? I got through it in three and a half weeks. So, but it's basically training yourself not to look at the other stuff, only look at that. And you say, well, the Bible's got a lot more. Yeah, but you're going to read the Bible more than once. So yeah, you could actually read through the entire Bible in under one month if you pick a topic. And I was literally reading every word. So I read it really quickly and said, hey, if it's not doing with family, marriage, and divorce, I'm just going to skip it and keep going. And what I would do is every time I found a relevant passage, I would write it down. Now, again, I didn't try to understand what the text said about marriage, family. I simply collected the verse. So that's another th uh, principle we're going to try here. As you try to find these different passages, don't try to understand what it's saying. Just record the passage. So don't try to understand it. Just so that's what we're doing here. We're going to collect all the passages. Then we're going to go back over them and try to understand what they're saying about the universe. So step one, just collect the verses. And yeah, you should be able to easily do it in 10 minutes or less if that's your only goal is to find the verses. So don't try to understand it, just find the passages, and then I'm guessing as we go through all different groups, 
they're going to come up with, say, 10 passages in one group, 11 in another group. You'll probably come up with different passages, and we'll figure out which ones belong on the list and which ones don't belong on the list. And really, the trick is you're better putting more verses on the list than less. You can go over it again when you study it in detail and say, you know what, this verse wasn't relevant. We'll take it off the list. Uh, so again, don't try to decide too much whether it belongs on the list or not right now. Just get the passages down, and then later on, we'll figure out which passages are relevant and which ones aren't. Okay? All right. Pardon me? Just question, question one. Right. I'm trying to get the group.
Pardon me? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Chapter in.
Mic on now? I do. Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, isn't it wonderful of being in the 21st century where you don't have to bring your Bibles to church? All you need to do is bring your smartphone, and uh, you got 40 translations instead of just one, and you can make the print as big as you want or as small as you want. Uh, yeah, wonderful time we live in, but you got to keep your smartphone charged. So, really frustrating to have a dead smartphone. You can't get at your Bible passages. And yeah, some of you are taking a shortcut where you're going on Google search to find these passages. That's something else you can do in the 21st century. However, I can tell you from experience, because I actually tried this, I tried to come up with the passages through Google search. Google search will not pick up all the text. It, it does pick up some. Uh, it's pretty, pretty good at that. And Bible Gateway is another one where you can actually pick up quite a few passages. But there's really no substitute for actually reading through the book yourself. Okay, survey number one. I'm going to ask each group. I presume you've got a spokesman for each group. If not, pick a spokesman. Okay. <laughs> All right. Question number one. In each group, how many passages did you find relevant to the beginning? Now, I was kind of listening into some of you. A lot of you are picking up passages that talk about the end of the universe. We're going to study that later. So guess what? We're going to do another exercise where we go through the book of Isaiah and find all the passages that talk about the history of the universe and the end of the universe. But I think one thing you're going to notice, a lot of the passages you picked up for the beginning of the universe are also relevant to the history and the end of the universe. So it's going to make our job easier as we go through this. And I purposely start out with a question about the beginning of the universe, because a lot of the texts we pick up for the beginning of the universe will be relevant to the follow-up questions we got. And so save those passages, because it's going to save you a lot of time when I ask you to pick up all the passages relevant to the uh, subsequent uh, questions. But let's start on this side of the group at the very back. Uh, how many uh, passages did you find in the 15 and a half minutes I gave you? Yes. Eight. Very good. Okay. What did you guys find? Uh, probably about ten. Ten? Okay, good. Eight, ten. How about this young couple in front? How many did you find? Not many. Not many. <laughs> All right. Eight? Nine. All right. In the back here, how many did you find? That counts as one. Five. Okay. How about this group here? Twelve. Twelve. All right. Okay. There's no prize, by the way, for the one who gets the most. <laughs> How about this group here? Twelve. So twelve and twelve. Good. Group in the back? Nine. How about this group over here? Nine. Over here? Twenty-three. All right. We should really come up with a prize for them, right? <coughs> now. <laughs> okay. I got a question for the group that found 23. Pardon me? I need to go back into the camera. Thank you. All right. Sorry. I forgot about the live streaming. I should ask the live streaming group. How many did the live streamers come up with? Three, okay. <laughs> Probably because. Well, you know what? I should have made a special assignment saying, all of you who are live streaming, I want you to participate in this as well. That would have been a good thing to do, but I'm glad at least somebody uh, gave it a shot. Okay, the group that found 23. How did you find those 23 in 15 and a half minutes? And what? Yeah. Well, I did. I went into heavens and I found out for myself 40 all the way to 61. There. Then I put earth and I found three in there. Okay, so you know what they did? They actually did the equivalent of a Google search. Uh, basically looked at the book of Isaiah, searched for the word heaven, searched for the word earth, that's how they came up with 23. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to, as a group, assemble all these passages. And then we're going to see which ones are actually relevant. Because I'm guessing some are relevant and some aren't. And as I mentioned earlier, it's good to put down some you think might not be relevant. 
if they have a possibility for being relevant, put them down, we can always get, get rid of them later. Okay, and I would imagine probably some year 23 will fall into that category because you've actually did a search on the word heaven and the word earth, you will probably come up with a reasonably exhaustive list. Although probably good to put in the word Lord as well, or Yahweh, because uh, there's some of the passages where it doesn't mention the heavens and the earth, but God actually says how he brings them about. Uh, one passage talks about stars, for example. Okay, but I'm guessing that some of those 23 will be relevant to the history and the end of the universe rather than beginning. But we'll figure that out. So if you want to know how many I came up with, it was 20. So, um, but I'm going to guess that a lot of yours uh, don't overlap, and which means we'll probably as a group come up with probably about 30 different passages. And then we're going to go through the exercise of eliminating the ones that really aren't relevant. Then step three, we're going to study in depth the passages that are relevant and find out what it's saying about the beginning of the universe. So basically what I'm doing here is, is showing you a technique uh, for discerning from the Bible uh, what it's teaching on different topics. Collect everything you may think might possibly be relevant, then sift out the ones that really aren't relevant, then you study them in depth. The temptation is to start studying in depth right away. And so, and what happens when you do that, you wind up missing critical biblical contributions to the subject. So just, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're just disciplining ourselves, get the data first. Don't try to understand it, just get the data. And if the database is big, we can always trim it down. Okay, so what we're gonna do next, I took you off the thing here because I got a little text here. I can actually write down uh, the relevant text. So I'm gonna begin uh, with this group. How about you, you came up with what, four or five? We were all by ourselves, so it was a little slow. A little slow, <laughs> and trying to figure out that smartphone, so. Yeah, I didn't do very well. Okay, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna start collecting the passages. If there's a passage that's not on our list, I want you to speak up. Okay, you're next, Hope. Yeah, go ahead, Hope. Okay, so we came up with um, six, three to four. Uh, Isaiah six, three to four. Okay, let me write that down. Okay, next one. 42.5. I'll bet you a lot of you had 42.5. Is there any way we can show it on the screen? Yeah, I'm going to show you in the screen, but I can't do that and type at the same time. So you'll get, you'll get this eventually. What's the next one? 45, verses 7, 12, and 18. Yeah, there's a lot in 45. And so it's verses 5 to 7? Yeah, we, we put 7, 12, and 18. Okay, 5. And... Uh, 45, 12, and what was the other one? 45, 18. Okay, anything else? Oh, yeah, uh, chapter 48. 48. Uh, how we have uh, 12, but more things than 13. I'll put 12 to 13, okay. 51, 13, and 15. 51. 13 and 51, 15. Or 13 and 16. 15 and 16, that's right. Okay? Uh, 65, and 18. So, that one might be more about the end. Yeah, it's really about the end. So, why don't we just skip that one because we'll pick that one up later. Yeah, we, we talked about that. Okay, 66, 1. 66, 1. Chapter 40? That's all right. 40? Yes, chapter 40, uh, verses 12, then 22, 22. 26. Hey, wait a minute. Then. So 40, 22, and 40, 26. And 28. And 28, yep. That's it. That's pretty good. So that's 26 and 28, right? Okay, 
group behind you. Do you have any passages that she didn't list? I think we, uh, we had maybe a couple. Uh, the, uh, 1310. 13, 13. Okay. That's it? Okay. How about you guys? Thirty seven. Oh, I'm glad you got that one. Thirty seven sixteen. chapter thirty seven verse twenty six. Oh twenty six. Okay. What was that, the last one? 43 verses 18 to 20. Okay. We have small because we have two scribes up here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have chapter 34 verses 12 through 10. Yeah, it's more about the history in the end. I don't think that qualifies as beginning. Okay, so chapters 40, 12 through 17. 40. Chapter 40. Yeah, hold on. That was chapter 40 what verses what? 12 to 17. Chapter 46, 9 to 11. Chapter 44, verse 24. Okay. Chapter 45, 7 to 12. We already have that one. Chapter 46, 10. Chapter 50, verse 3. Okay. 54, 1 through 4. Yeah, I'm guessing that's more of the history in the end. Yeah. Chapter 66, we have something that I might come Yeah, 66, 1. Yeah. 42, 5, which one we already have? 42, 5, we already got. All right, we're already up to 28. <laughs> <laughs> I only created two slides, so I'm going to have to do a third slide. Okay, what? 64, 8. 64, 8, let me check. And again, I think there's probably more to do at the end, but I'll tell you what, I'll write it down anyway. We can always look at it later and see. So I was 64.8. Okay? I think it's just light. I'm not sure if we got 44.24. Yeah, we have that one. I think you gave all the ones. That yeah, I'm up to 29 already, so. Can you get 51.13? 51.13, let me check. Yeah. Yeah, we got that one. Okay, in the back? 38.8, no, we don't have that one. And, um, yeah, we've eliminated that one because it's not really relevant to the beginning. Uh, I don't know about 40.15 or both sides, but 40.15. Uh, we'll write it down. Wait a minute. Whoops. Uh, let me delete that. Okay, what was the passage? 40. 4015. 4015. Yeah, I think we got that one already. Yeah, we got that one. That's it? Yes. You know, something dropped out in the internet search that for a framework, the most of these come into what's called utero. Isaiah from chapter 40 
55. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, because there Isaiah is talking about the great God compared to in comparison to puny man. And so he's talking about creation. The first 39 chapters, Isaiah uses his name 16 times, but it never shows up after 39. So we have that. And in the last chapters of 50. Six through sixty-six are more eschatological. Correct. Talking about the end times. Yeah. So right in the middle, from forty to fifty-five, is where we're. Is a good well, line. I could have given you a shortcut. Just look at chapters forty to fifty-two and skip the rest. <laughs> now that's about ninety percent of everything it's got to say in the that's beginning right. of the universe. Yeah. yeah. And we're also going to find out those same chapters are the ones that say about ninety-five percent of everything Isaiah's got to say about the Trinity. So yeah, if you want a shortcut, and see, if you've read the Bible a few times, you kind of pick that up. Okay, I know that's roughly where Isaiah deals with that subject, so you kind of start there first, then you flesh it out. So, in the back. 40? Uh, do we have that one? Uh, we got 12 to 17. Okay, what's that passage again? 40, 25 to 26. Okay, we'll put that down and we'll check it out. Oh, well, we do have 22 already, yeah. But as 20 to 26, we'll see how relevant that is, okay? Yeah. We also oh. have 13 to 10 and 13 to 16. Let me see if we got those. We got, yeah, we got those two. Okay. Okay, the rest of you, any other texts that we've not, I mean, that group that found 23, what do you have that we haven't got on our list yet? Oh, the guy who had the list is gone? <laughs> You're supposed to have a vice uh, spokesman. So. All right. Yes. Well, there's only two chapters in the Bible that talk about astrology. Mm -hmm. Isaiah is one of them. You'll actually see a text that talks about the astrologers and what God thinks of them. It's not very favorable towards the astrologers. <laughs> so, uh, astronomy is, is addressed. In fact, some of these texts that you've picked up, you're going to see that it explicitly talks about astronomy. So, but uh, yeah, you will see a passage about the astrologers. And so you made a very good point. The reason why there's so much content in Isaiah about the universe, he was writing at a time when people were looking at the heavens the wrong way. And, you know, kind of what Isaiah is saying, the heavens really do declare the glory of God, but not the way you think. So, so yeah, I mean, it's partly polemical against all this emphasis on astrology. And it wasn't just the astrologers within the nation of uh, Judea, the surrounding nations were much more heavily invested in astrology. So much so there was a time in the history of the Egyptian Empire when 25% of their national income went to support astrology. Now, it's because of that enormous investment, we astronomers today are able to take that ancient Egyptian emphasis on astrology and use it for astronomical purposes. In fact, I wrote a blog article, gee, about six months ago, mentioning the fact that the Egyptians had recorded the timing of variable stars with such great precision, were able to use their timing data to actually come up with superior models for the interior physics of stars. Why? Because we have a 3,000-year database. We got our measurements today, and we got the measurements of the ancient Egyptians, and they're a little bit different. We're able to use those differences. What amazes me, without any advanced clocks, the Egyptians were able to time uh, the events of variable stars with sufficient precision that they could give you the period of the variability to five significant figures. 
all done without clocks. And it's because they observed these things over generations. And so they would average the data over generations and could come up with a number that accurate that we compare with measurements today that are good to eight places of the decimal. We look at the difference and we're able to come up with a better model of the interior physics of stars. So as an astronomer, I'm grateful the Egyptians were, quote, focused that much on astrology and put that much money into it because of the astronomy uh, that was kind of the byproduct of their efforts. And even a Christian like uh, uh, Kepler, Johann Kepler, how he funded his astronomical research was through astrology. He said, I don't believe any of this stuff, but if people are willing to pay me all his money for it, I'll take advantage of it. And use that to support his research in astronomy. And actually, there's evidence that ancient Egyptian astronomers actually employed the same tactic. Hey, if the pharaoh is all interested in this stuff and wants to give me all his money, I'll take it. Uh, but the real motivation uh, was to understand the actual physics of the heavens. Yes? Uh, can you comment on the Tower of Babel account? Does it have any relevance at all to what you're talking about? Uh, not really. I mean, it is true that the ancient Babylonians uh, were into astrology. Um, <clears throat> And <clears throat> they were actually, as it says in the Bible text, they built this tower as a way to unify the peoples of the world under one government. Yeah. And kind of the way you can look at the history of the Old Testament, it's God stepping in to stop one world government. Realizing if we have one world government, because humans are sinners, the leaders of that government will use their power to oppress the citizens of the world. And so what you see in the, uh, uh, the post-flood era, it's God basically setting up a free market competition among nations. We're not going to have one nation anymore. We're going to have multiple nations, and they're going to have to compete with one another for citizens. And that actually motivates the nation not to oppress the people too much, because if you oppress them too much, they will leave. But notice that the really oppressive nations in world history they build walls to stop the people from leaving. And so I re, you know, I'm old enough to remember when you had the uh, Berlin Wall, it was built to stop the East Germans from leaving. And unlike other walls where you got the soldiers facing outward, the soldiers faced it inward. So uh, rather than trying to defend, they were basically trying to prevent people from leaving. Uh, and I actually grew up in a neighborhood uh, with a lot of East Germans who in spite of all the efforts of the Soviets managed to escape. Uh, but a lot of them lost their lives just trying to leave one nation and go to the next nation. Well, I was just thinking maybe they're, you, know, you remember they were trying to like build a ziggurat or whatever to, to heaven and they had some kind of belief to stop the frog career or something that they could do that. Maybe well, not, maybe not. <laughs> I, I think what, if you, you kind of read the history of this, they were really trying to, you know, we really don't need God. We can do it all ourselves. And this is going to be an amazing technological marvel. And yeah, it's the pride of humanity uh, when we think we can do anything we want and fail to realize we wouldn't be here uh, without God. And I run into that a lot of my speaking, where they think, look at the amazing technology we developed. But hey, if it wasn't God creating certain animals, we wouldn't have ever gotten out of the Stone Age. And so we fail to give credit where credit is due. We think we did it all on our own. Or you got people like Stephen Hawking today who say, my goal in life is to know everything that God knows, to know the mind of God. <coughs> well, what you're really doing is saying, you know, I'm like God. And uh, that <coughs> causes problems. And you know, after all, in the context what you see in Genesis, uh, we already had an episode uh, where there was one people, one place. And what happened? Uh, evil ran out of control. People were killing one another. And the human race was in danger of self-extermination. Keep in mind, the flood, not so much a judgment, was a rescue. It was God inter intervening to prevent humanity from self-extermination. But basically, what we saw right after the flood, the peoples of the world were repeating the mistake they made before the flood. We're, going to be, we're not going to be divided. We're going to be one people in one place. We're not going to scatter over the face of the earth. 
we're going to stay here, one nation, and we're all going to be part of one people, one government. Prescription for runaway oppression and evil. And so God's always been in the business of trying to have free market competition among the nations. Whenever any nation threatened to become the dominant power of the world, God stepped in and put a stop to it. So uh, it would be a problem if the United States became a nation that ruled the world. Yeah, we're a democracy. When you put that much power in the hands of a few, it will be abused. And so, and incidentally, the Bible does predict sometime in the future there will be a return to one world government. But when that happens, just like it happened in the past, evil will run out of control. And so... And Christ will step in. If you want to see one of the most dramatic examples of that, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel talks about how God stepped in and stopped the Assyrians. Then he stopped the Babylonians. Then he stopped the, uh, the Persians. Then he stopped the Greeks. And he stopped the Romans. Those were all attempts to establish one world government. And God stepped in and put a stop to all of them so that his message can go out. Hey, we're a little bit off the topic. Okay. Um, let me uh, pop this up. Uh, no more questions or comments. We have a few uh, more minutes to wrap up. Okay. Let me uh, pop this up for you. So, these are all the texts. They're not in order. I didn't have time to put them in order. Uh, I'll do that for you next week. Uh, but these are all the texts that we came up with. So, no, you don't have to write them down. I'm going to give them all to you. Okay. And so it's 32 in total. You can skip those because I just had to duplicate the slide in order to save time. So, yeah, we got 32 texts. And uh, what we're going to do next is we're actually going to go through those 32 texts one by one. I'll ask you the question, is this really relevant to the question I gave you? If it is, we keep it on the list. If it's not, we drop it. And then once we got our... Uh, lists, we're going to go start going through each passage one at a time and say, what does this text actually say about the beginning of the universe? Now, one of the things you're going to discover in this, in this uh, exercise, you're going to come up with one conclusion based on one text, then you're going to go to the next text and say, oops, we need to adjust what we thought was coming through that particular passage. That's what the integration of biblical text is all about. Realizing that God communicates truth and nothing but truth, a conclusion you get from one text must cohere with a conclusion you get from another text. But what we're going to do is go through the passages one at a time, figure out what it's saying, but be open to making adjustments based on what else we learn from the text, and we'll kind of have a final wrap-up. But I think what you're going to see through this exercise, I think it's going to blow your mind just how much the book of Isaiah says about the beginning of the universe and how God brings about that beginning in such a way that we humans can actually live within this incredible universe. Okay, so that's kind of a figure out where we're going to be going with this. I got three minutes left, so what we're going to do is actually start. Uh, I think the first passage we looked at was this one, Isaiah 6. Let's actually look at Isaiah 6 and see if it's uh, relevant uh, to our text. And yeah, I think you all notice just how many of these passages come from Isaiah 40 uh, through to 51. Uh, that's a good 90% of everything we got here. Okay, Isaiah 6, verses 3 to 4. It says, uh, Holy, well, let me start here. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their noise, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And so it's talking about what happened the year of King Isaiah, and uh, how uh, these angels uh, were coming in, and uh, this is uh, what they said. And uh, isn't it interesting that when holy uh, angels speak, how frequently you get a phrase like this, emphasizing the holiness of the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. Now, do you think this is relevant to our question or not? Okay. It's relevant in this sense uh, that God created the universe in such a way 
it, it would, all of it would be full of his glory. So it's basically making a point, there's nothing irrelevant in the universe. Something for us astronomers to be concerned about. Now, when we find an exomoon or exoplanet, hey, that's relevant to declaring the glory of God. If we find a little meteor, it's relevant to the glory of God. A speck of dust, if we find a neutrino particle, it's relevant to the glory of God. All of it counts. And when you think about how vast the universe is with 200 billion galaxies, each with an average of 200 billion stars, and there's other stuff besides, wow. Uh, and all of it's relevant to the glory of God. So I'm voting we keep this text, okay? You can vote against me, by the way. <laughs> so, but I, now, I'm not sure about the angels saying what they said is relevant. Uh, so what we could say is that, uh, uh, well, no, I think we, we got to, in order to keep the context, yeah, we got to keep those passages so we actually understand what's going on. So Isaiah 6, 3 to 4 is a keeper. And then we move on to Isaiah, I think it's 13, is the next text we pick up. Uh, here it is, Isaiah 13, 10. And then we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do them one at a time. Didn't we start 10 minutes later today? <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice try, nice try. <laughs> Actually, we did start reasonably on time. But, uh, yeah, somebody was asking me, can't we have the class go to 1 o'clock? There's actually a church that uses this room uh, at 2 o'clock. So. And I know you guys all <laughs> like to talk to one another. The fellowship time after the Paradoxes class, I think, is really rich. So I don't want to cut into that. But, uh, and there are times when I go five minutes over anyway. Okay, verse 10. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened, and the sun will not give its light. Okay, I think you could make a case that this is more relevant to the end of the universe than it is the beginning of the universe. So don't throw that passage away. We're going to get to it. Uh, but maybe it's one that we drop from the list just because uh, it's really focusing more on the end uh, than it is the beginning. Uh, let's see if we can jump to 13. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty <coughs> and the day of his burning uh, anger. Uh, I think you can make the same case there. Yeah, that it's really the referring end. to the end than it is the beginning. Uh, but hey, thanks for picking that up because that's going to actually help us answer question number two uh, that's on uh, your uh, study list. So what we did, we uh, keep uh, Isaiah 6, but we drop Isaiah 13. And hey, it's time to close the class. We'll pick this up next time. And we're all going to be able to go away with a complete list of relevant scriptures on the beginning of the universe. And so I'll prepare that for you. Uh, but I want you to go through the exercise uh, helping me get this list together. And we're interested to see of the 32 texts how many we wind up with. But now we're down to 30 texts. So uh, I'm guessing we're going to be somewhere in the 20s. All right, Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we've had in class today. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, for Josh and the sermon he gave this morning. And Father, we pray that this would be the third time that the church has uh, picked up and began to grow uh, through new converts coming to faith in Christ. And Father, I pray as we leave this and go our busy ways throughout the next week, you'll give us opportunities to be a witness for you and to show people uh, your love, your truth, and your life. And Father, by the work of your Holy Spirit, may we see these people receiving more of your love, life, and truth as we receive more of your love, life, and truth. And may we actually see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.